ألف لام ذلك الكتاب ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین جزاکم اللہ خیران and welcome everybody to this evening's program to all our Muslim brothers and sisters and also to Christian and brothers and sisters as well brothers and sisters in humanity my name is Tahir Alam and my humble task for this evening is to accommodate this debate really make sure there's some order to it and hopefully, inshallah, that it, things will run on time. And um, I'd rather be doing that than what these two gentlemen are doing, which is much more braver and takes much more courage than to do what I'm doing. So I'm pleased to be where I am, really, in the, in, in, in the middle of them, rather than on, on, on each side. Um, as I said, my name is Tahir Alam, and uh, this evening's program, hopefully, uh, will be an interesting one uh, for all the people who are attending, as well as for people who are participating. And the question that we want to discuss this evening, in fact, is something of profound importance. It is the single most important question that anybody can ever discuss or think about and ponder over. And it is, for, it is with this in mind that we should be actually sitting there. Because where we die, what, what happens to us when we die and where we came from, what is the meaning and purpose of life, all these things are very important questions which all of us are asking, which all of, all, of the, all of humanity is asking. So what has God communicated to, to, to the human being? What is his message? Which is his true message? And it is this subject that we are here to discuss today. As I said, this is a message of profound importance and of meaning to every single one of us. The event was advertised as a debate uh, and it's also obviously a debate really, but it's a debate that's been organized in the spirit of gaining understanding. It's, a, it's in the spirit of creating greater understanding. So it's not a slanging match or an insulting match, but hopefully two gentlemen who are here today are men of faith. They take their faith very seriously. They, believe, they take their belief in God very seriously. They take religion very seriously as well. And I think that's important, that's something very important to acknowledge. As the Quran in, in, its, own, in its own language expressed the etiquette of disagreement, the etiquette of discussion, the etiquette of debate, you know, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them in ways that are best and most gracious. For thy, for thy Lord knoweth who strays and who is on the straight path and who receives guidance. So it is in that spirit of creating understanding and of being guided that we are here today and hopefully not much more than that but this is a very uh, profound area to, to, to be talking about. The need for this discussion, the, the need for this debate in fact in the current time you know is it could not be more uh, could not be more urgent and more timely because in a general sense we live in a secular society where religions are seen very much as, 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 as people who are fighting amongst themselves so I think it's also an important opportunity for us to demonstrate etiquette that we are, we, are, we are people who can speak to each other, converse with each other, each other and exchange views, exchange differences, you know, in a spirit of respect, in a spirit of understanding. But at the same time, not shy away from disagreeing because, you know, there is a political correctness culture as well. Don't say anything is wrong. Otherwise, people will be offended. We get so much of this. We think we, uh, I mean, I firmly believe that there is no need for that. I think we should be respectful in the way that we differ with people. But as long as the etiquette is there, the respect is there, the beauty is there in our, in our conduct, then we should differ where we think, you know, where, where we think that we are right and other people are, are not so right or maybe partly right. So we should be able to say that openly and, and, with, and, and with confidence. So there should be no uh, political correctness really in, in, in uh, as far as uh, discussing matters of profound truth are concerned because that have an imp that, the, those matters have implication for the entire humanity and what happens to us 
uh, you know, in this life and in, in life after death as well. For Christians as well as Jews, as well as uh, Muslims and indeed many other religions also. Uh, before I introduce the um, uh, before I introduce the two uh, uh, two, two debatees, um, I like to acknowledge also the the contribution that has been uh, forwarded by first of all the people who are hosting this event, the um, uh, Desi Nawab Conference Hall, uh, a name which um, is not quite um, fluid on my sort of tongue yet. Really, uh, I've not come here before actually, so uh, I got to get used to it a little bit. Um, uh, they have actually given a very subsidized rate to accommodate this discussion. I'd like to thank them first and also Brother Habib as well, uh, as well as a, a Muslim aide who have sponsored, uh, you know, uh, partly this particular event as well. And there will be an opportunity for people to contribute to uh, Muslim aid a bit later on uh, when the program finishes. Uh, those are some of the introductory words really. Moving on to the participants, if I do a brief introductions and then what I will do is I will introduce the program for this evening as well, so you've got a good picture of how the proceedings are going to go and what the, ru and, and what the rules are going to be uh, this evening. Um, on, my, on, the, on your right hand side, we have uh, the Christian representative. His name is Carlton MacDonald, who is a senior lecturer at Derby University and an IT expert, and he's also a devout Christian preacher. He is an upcoming debater that has debated many modernist Christians on a personal level and held public debates with Muslim representatives in the past. Carlton has a strong understanding of biblical literature and has authored a book, uh, a book on the, uh, uh, with the title Let My People Know, The Truth About Modern Bible Versions. And the Muslim representative in this, in this evening's discourse uh, is Adnan Rashid. He is presently studying history at the University of London. He specializes in history of Islamic civilization, science, ancient manuscripts and antiques. He is a public speaker with an experience of delivering presentations on Islamic topics in a number of universities. He is an active member of Hitin Institute and forthcoming uh, Islamic Society for Dialogue and Debate. And he has also publicly de uh, debated a host of Christian clergy. He is presently serving as a khatib for Harrow Muslim Youth Association and he's also appeared on a number of radio programs to uh, represent Islam and Muslims. So those are the two speakers' profiles. Uh, moving swiftly on to, I know I'm, I'm sure that you're not here to listen to me really. Um, uh, moving swiftly on to tonight's program, uh, the format for the program, and I'm going to be quite strict on timing and things, so I would, I would request uh, quite humbly that uh, whether it is the audience when it comes to your question time or whether it is the speakers to heed my notice as it were and, um, and, and, and stick to the time and I hope that you will cooperate with me for a smoother program hopefully inshallah this evening. Uh, the, first, the, the, pro, the first speaker for the evening will be Adnan and he will speak for 25 minutes. Then the second speaker will speak also for 25 minutes. Next, there will be uh, an opportunity for a rebuttal. So Adnan again will speak for 15 minutes and uh, Carlton again will speak for 15 minutes. After that, there would be an opportunity for one speaker to stand here and the other one to stand over there and for there to be a 10 minute direct rebuttal. Okay, so one speaker will get a chance for 10 minutes to ask questions of the other speaker and the other person will also get a chance to ask questions directly to the speaker here. Once that session finishes, I will be making some announcements and things like that, so you'll get a little bit of a breather at that time, perhaps, uh, and, uh, and so on. And then the Q&A from the audience will begin. Um, and you'll be able to ask questions. We have a mic here. So one of the uh, kindly gentlemen from the organizers will pick, up, pick this one up and hopefully we'll be able to pose questions directly to either of the speakers uh, this evening uh, uh, by coming forward, uh, either coming forward, he'll be standing in the middle there and uh, hopefully he'll be able to reach most people who, I don't know how the wire is going to go over there to the sisters, but anyway, we'll come to that hurdle when we come to that. So let's not worry about that now. Um, so without um, any, f uh, any further ado, um, I'd like to ask, uh, to, to begin the discussion for this evening, I'd like to ask uh, Adnan Rashid to begin this evening's discussion. Adnan Rashid, thank you very much. 
بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد اعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ان نحن نزلنا الذكر وان له لحافظون we shall show them our signs on the horizons and within themselves until it will become clear to them that it is the truth surah fusilat 4153 today's topic which i will be addressing brothers and sisters in islam friends and elders will be is the quran a divine revelation from god this is an interesting question which the christians as well as the jews and atheists have been asking for a long time we will examine some evidence today we will see whether quran really is of divine origin we will see whether quran is what it claims to be we will cover the evidence about quran's literary miracle we will cover the evidence about quran's scientific miracle we will cover the evidence regarding quran's historical miracle we will cover the evidence of quran's prophecies and we will see whether this book has any divine origin whatsoever we will see whether muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam who the christian and the jews accuse of forging the text of quran whether he was an embryologist an archaeologist a historian an egyptologist and a soothsayer and a poet and a professor or a scientist or a gynecologist we will see all these evidences in the quran and we see whether muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam had any of these qualifications if he did not if he did not then there is something divine in this book if these realities are to be found in this book the definition of the quran first of all The Quran is the Arabic speech of Allah which he revealed to Muhammad in wording and meaning and which has been preserved in mushafs and has reached us by mutawatir by continuous reporting and is a challenge to mankind to produce something similar to it why does Quran challenge mankind to produce something similar to it we'll come to know when we examine the contents one by one we will come to know why quran challenges the mankind to produce something like it first of all because my opponent or my friend more like carlton mcdonald he is a christian he is a christian preacher i would like to bring some evidence from his own book regarding quran we will see whether the bible talks about quran or not isn't it shocking carlton so In book of Deuteronomy chapter 33 verse 2 we read the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Sia unto them he shined forth from Mount Paran and he came with 10000 saints from his right hand when the fiery law three locations Sinai Sia Paran we know Sinai is in Egypt where Moses came from we know Sia is near Galilee where Jesus was born where is Paran P A R A N Let's go to the Encyclopedia Biblica published in 1914 edited by Reverend T K Shane on page 3583 3583 it is stated Paran is the Arab tribal name Faran or Faran The description of Faran given by Eusebius and Jerome the early church fathers Before Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam before Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was born Eusebius and Jerome the early church fathers this is the description of Quran they gave 
Quran is a turn over against Arabia southward. Southward. And Jerome adds that Quran was the mountain and the desert of Saracens. Saracens literally means the Arabs. Those who live in tents. If Quran is Arabia, three locations in Deuteronomy 33.2. Sinai, Saya, Paran, which is Arabia, and from, from Paran will come Lord with 10,000 saints with a fiery law in his right hand. Who came with a law from Arabia? That is the question. Who came with a law from Arabia? No one else except Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And when he conquered Mecca, for the details, you can consult the book of Ibn Ishaq, the earliest biography of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa took Mecca, there were 10,000 saints, 10,000 sahaba with him in that army. So the biblical prophecy fulfilled word by word. Now I can give more evidence to substantiate that Quran is Arabia from the Bible. In Genesis 21, 21, it is stated that Ishmael, the father of the Arabs, dwelt in the wilderness Quran. Then Genesis 21, 18, 19, we read that when he was dying of thirst, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God Almighty, forged, caused a well to come about underneath his feet. Which is this well? Where is this well? In the wilderness of Paran. There is no other well in the wilderness of Paran except the well of, well of Zamzam. And according to the description of Eusebius and Jerome, the city of Paran is in Arabia southward, which is Mecca, and that's where the well of Zamzam is. Very, very precise location in the Bible. Who came with the law from this city? I'll leave the answer to my friend. Now, another amazing, fascinating passage in the Bible. Book of Isaiah, chapter 21, verse 13 to 17. It states, The burden upon Arabia, all the glory of Kedar shall fail. The mighty men of the children of Kedar shall be diminished. So Kedar is mentioned within Arabia. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 21, verse 13. It states, The burden upon Arabia. So Kedar is in Arabia. Who is Kedar? Kedar is the second son of Ismail. Book of Genesis chapter 25, verse number 13. It states, these are the names of the sons of Ishmael. Firstborn, Nebuchadnezzar. Second, Kedar. If son is in Arabia, father is also in Arabia. And the father who is Ishmael is in Paran. If Paran is where Ishmael is living, then Paran is Arabia because the son Kedar is in Arabia. I'll leave that for you to work out. Book of Isaiah, chapter 29, uh, chapter 29 verse number 12. And listen to me carefully. Pay attention to this particular verse. Book of Isaiah chapter 9, 29 verse 12. And the book, and the book is delivered to him that is not learned. Saying, read this, I pray thee. And he saith, I am not learned. I am not learned. When did this happen in the history of mankind? Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was in the cave of Hira. Angel Jibra'il came to him, said to him, Iqra, read the very first verses of Quran to be revealed. Chapter 96 of Quran, Iqra, Bismi Rabbi Kalladi Khalaq, Khalaq al Insana min Alaq, and it goes on. Read. And Prophet Muhammad said, Ma ana biqari'in. I do not know how to read. Consult the book of Bukhari for the details. And book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse number 12. 13 centuries before Prophet Muhammad was born, is telling you when the book is given to the one who is unlearned, illiterate, and is said to him, read, he will say, I do not know how to read. Which book? Which book will be given to him? The Quran. There is no other book with Muhammad Then the chapter 42 of book of Isaiah is full of details about a man, about a messenger coming, he will bring justice to the land, and he will put the idol worshippers to shame. He will bring a new law because in the verse number 4, verse number 4, book of Isaiah chapter 42, it is clearly stated, He shall not fail, whoever this person is. He will fill the earth with judgment. He will fill the earth with judgment, justice. And the isles shall wait for his law. The isles will wait for his law, what law is this? 
What law is this? And where is this man coming from? When we go to the verse number 11, fascinatingly, we read, Let the wilderness and the cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar doeth inhabit. Who is Kedar? I've already substantiated Kedar is the second son of Ismail, who is in, in Arabia. But let's go to the sources of the Christian scholars. According to the Hebrew and English lexicon of Old Testament, based upon the works of William Jesenius, edited by Francis Brown, on the page number 871, it is stated, Kedar means tribe of nomads in Arab desert. So this man who will come with a new law, who will put justice on the land, who will spread peace on the land, is coming from the wilderness of Kedar. And the term is his law. In the verse number 4, it says his law. Isaiah followed Mosaic law, so did Jesus. Jesus in the chapter, chapter 5, verse number 17 of the book of Matthew, he stated, Think not that I have come to abolish the law. Instead, I've come to fulfill the law and the prophets. If that is true, then this is not Jesus, this is not Isaiah, this is someone from Arabia, from the wilderness of Kedar, with a new law. I'll leave that for you to work out. This is no other book than Quran. Literary miracle of the Quran. Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 23 to 24. And if you are in doubt as to what we sent down to our servant, then produce a surah similar to it. Produce it if you can. This was a challenge to the people who did not know the scientific miracle of the Quran, the historical miracle of the Quran, the Egyptologi Egyptologist miracle of the Quran. These miracles were hidden from them. There was only one challenge to these people. Produce a literature like this. Walid bin Mughira, in the book of Ibn Hisham, volume 1, Page number 270, it is stated, Walid bin Mughira, he stated about the Qur'an, when he heard the Qur'an, this Qur'an is a type of magic that has an effect on its listeners. That has an effect on its listeners. Walid bin Mughira was a poet. Abu Jahl came to him, one of the biggest enemies of Islam, and he said, Walid, what's wrong with you? Why do you feel like this? He said, I am one of the best people who knows what poetry is. This is not poetry. I know the sorcerers. This is not sorcery. This is something different. This is something else. Then another disbeliever from the Quraysh, Utba bin Rabia, he went to see Rasulullah to speak to him nicely, to convince him. And Rasulullah recited chapter 41, verse 1 to 4 to him. He came back to his people. He said, Oh people, I have heard a speech the like of which I have never heard before. I swear by Allah, it is not magic, nor is it poetry, nor is it sorcery. O oh, gathering of Quraysh, listen to me, leave this man alone, for I swear by Allah, the speech that I have heard from him will soon be a news. Walid bin Mughira. Another poet, Umais, he went to see Rasulullah And when he left, he went back to his people. And he said, I met a person in Mecca, who claims to have been sent by God. The people claim that he is a poet or a sorcerer or a magician. Yet I have heard the words of sorcerers. And these words are in no way resemble, resembling those uttered by a sorcerer. And also compared his words to verse of poet. But such words cannot be uttered by a poet. By Allah, he is the truthful one and they are the liars, the Qurayshis. And Jubair bin Matam, when he heard the Quran, he became a Muslim. We know the story of Umar bin Khattab. He went to kill Rasulullah with an unleashed sword in his hand. And someone told him on the way that your sister and your brother-in-law are Muslim. He went to see them. He heard them reciting the Quran, Surah Taha. And when the sister recited, ar rahmanu ala al arsh istawa, he cried. He could not take it any longer. He said, take me to Muhammad. He went to Muhammad and he said, Ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. This is Umar bin Khattab. Now we come to the scientific miracle of the Quran. Embryology. If we are to assume that Muhammad is the author of the Quran, then we have to accept that he was an embryologist or gynecologist or a scientist. Oh, he had access to microscopes, top of the range microscopes. Let's see what the Quran says. We then placed him as a drop 
in a place of settlement, firmly fixed, drop. Then we made the drop into a leech-like structure, leech-like structure. And then we changed the leech-like structure into a chewed-like substance, chewed-like substance. Then we made out of that chewed-like substance bones, number four, bones. When we clothed the bones with flesh, number five, flesh, we developed out of him another creation. Five stages. Nutfa, drop. Alaka, leech-like structure. Mudga, these are the words used in the verse of Quran. Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 13 to 15. These are the words used in the Quran in Arabic. Nutfa, alaka, mudga, idham, laham, and ansha'a. These five words. Now we have to see how the embryo develops within the womb of the mother. That is the first stage. That is the nutfa, the drop, the part of the drop which forms the beginning stages of an embryo in the womb of the mother. Next stage, alaka, the leech-like substance. Now, the top two pictures are of uh, a human embryo. And the bottom two pictures are of leech. Real leech. And Quran tells us that this is alaka. Alaka is something which clings on to other things. And only a leech cling on, clings on to the other things. Leech is like a parasite. So Quran, the word is very, very precise. Alaka meaning it is clinging on to the others in order to food, in order to feed itself. So the first two pictures of human embryo, the bottom two pictures are of leech. And you can see the similarity the Quran describes. Now, mudga, the chewed like substance. The Quran uses very precise language. Mudga. What does a mudga look like? Chewed like substance. Look at the picture. This is inside the womb of the mother. There is no way that Muhammad sallallahu would have known all of this. And when you look at the picture, you can see it looks like a chewed like substance that has been chewed. You can see the marks of teeth. So the next stage is idam, the bone formation. Now this is a stage of idam when the bones are formed. And then the next stage is laham, when the meat has been put on the baby. And this is exactly how the modern scientists describe it. Now when we go to the modern scientists and see what they have to say. Dr. Keith Moore, professor of anatomy and cell biology in the University of Toronto, in his book, Developing Human, 3rd edition, 1982, on page number 364, he states, the shape of the skeleton determines the general appearance of the embryo in the bones. So during the seven week, muscles do not develop at the same time, but their development follows soon after. This is exactly what Quran tells us, that idam is formed first. The bones are formed first, then the laham is given in the verse of Surah Nur, chapter 23, verse number 13 to 15. That's what the Quran is telling us, and this is modern research. The highest authority in the field of embryology is stating this. Then Dr. Keith Moore was confronted by some Muslim scholars about these verses in the Quran, and this is what he said. At first, I was astonished by the accuracy of the statements that were recorded in the 7th century AD. Before the science of embryology was established, the interpretation of the verses in the Quran and the Sunnah, translated by Sheikh Azindani, are to best of my knowledge, accurate. Dr. Keith Moore, tell me Muhammad Sallallahu was an embryologist. Tell me he had a microscope studying all of these different stages and he came up with accurate explanation of these different stages. Then Dr. Prasad, a Hindu doctor in the University of Minnesota, Sorry, Manitoba, in Canada, he states, Muhammad was a very ordinary man. He could not read, didn't know how to write. In fact, he was an illiterate. We are talking about 1400 years ago. You have some illiterate person making profound statements that are amazingly accurate of a scientific nature. I personally cannot see how this could be a chance. There are too many accuracies and like Dr. Moore, I have no difficulty in my mind reconciling that this is a divine inspiration or revelation which led him to these statements. This is a Hindu doctor who is an authority in the field of embryology and gynecology in the Uni University of Manitoba in Canada. 
Now, fingerprints. In Surah Qiyamah, verse number 3 to 4, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, Yes, we are able to put together in perfect order the very tips of his fingers. This is talking about someone who's going to be punished. And people, when they were asking Rasulullah they were asking questions to Muhammad, we will, be bring, we will be brought back to life after we died? We will become mud and dust? And someone will bring us back to life? Allah answered this question that we will even bring back the finger pose. The finger pose. What is the significance of finger pose in 7th century? None. Nothing. Muhammad surely did not know that all the human beings have different fingerprints. So far, the scientists haven't found two human beings who have exactly the same fingerprints. This is what the Quran is saying. Then we go on to astronomy. Astronomy. Have not those who disbelieved known that the heavens and the earth were one connected entity? Then we separated them. Now, the scientists believe that matter and antimatter were together in the beginning. And earth was formed by separating matter from antimatter. So earth is matter, and what is in the space out there is antimatter. So someone separated this. Allah is telling us, we separated the universe. We separated earth from the, from the space. So this is very, very clear in the Quran. There are many, many more verses in the Quran. Now I come to the B. Surah Nahal. It states in chapter number 16, verse number 68. And your Lord inspired the bee, al nahal Take for yourself among the mountains, houses among the trees, and in which they construct. So bee, the word is female. Nahal word is a female word, feminine word. It is not male, it's not masculine word. Now what is the significance of this in 7th century Arabia? Nothing. First person to realize that the worker bees, the ones, the worker bee, the one which goes out to collect the honey is a female. This was first realized by a man called Richard Remnant in 1637 in England. This was not known before that the worker bee is a female. Quran tells us it is a female who goes out to work. So I think the sisters have some work to do. Pollinating winds. And Quran in Surah Hijr. Chapter 15, verse number 22, it states, And we have sent the pollinating winds. No one knew at the time the winds are the ones which carry the pollination for the flowers. Quran is telling us this 14 centuries ago. And there are many, many more uh, scientific miracles which I cannot cover at this point. This was tip of the iceberg. If we were to study oceanography, if we were to study astronomy, if we were to study zoology, Geology, I have evidences for everything, but the time does not permit me. So if you go for ant in Surah Namul 27, 17, 18, it says the ant will be broken and was scared. The Solomon's army is coming and ant will be broken. And we know today the, the body, the structure of ant is like glass. It doesn't get flattened, it gets broken. And rain in Surah Zukhruf 43, chapter 43, verse number 11, Allah states that we send rain in due measure. Rasulullah did not know that rain comes in due measure. And today we found out if there is more raining than required, we have disasters. So, the historical accuracy of Quran. Quran uses the word Suhf. In Surah Ala, chapter 87, verse 16 to 19. In Nahada Fi Suhufi Al Ula, Suhufi Ibrahim of Musa. All the Muslims are aware of this surah. Suhufi Ibrahim of Musa. What is the significance of Suhuf? Why did not Allah use the word Kitab? Kutubu, Kutub Ibrahim of Musa. In Nahada Fi Kutub Al Ula. Allah could have used this word Kutub, the books. Allah used the word scripture. The literal meaning of scroll is a scroll which literally rolls in and out. As you can see on the screen there, Quran. Rasulullah did not know what the Dead Sea Scrolls look like. Dead Sea Scrolls are scrolls, literally suhf. It is not a kitab, it is not a codex, it is not in book form. And Quran uses very precise language for this particular phenomenon. Then we come to the king of Yusuf In Surah Yusuf, chapter number 12, 
verse 43. We read and it states, And the king said, Verily I saw seven fat cows, whom seven lean ones were devouring. The word king, 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 again and again, the entire surah where he's talking about the king, it doesn't say Pharaoh. It says king. Deenul Malik. Waqal al Malik. Said the king. The religion of the king. And the Quran in the same surah in, chapter, in verse number 21 states that he was in Egypt. And when we go to Musa, in same book, Quran, Surah Araf, chapter 7, verse number 104, Allah uses the word Pharaoh for the king. And Musa said, O Pharaoh, verily I am a messenger from the Lord of the words. So how did Rasulullah know that to call the king of Joseph as king and to call the king of Musa as Pharaoh? Now when we come to the modern research of hieroglyphics, we realize that in the Encyclopedia Biblica, chapter regarding Pharaoh, page number 3687, we read, We are now certain that the word Pharaoh is derived from the expression for king used by later Egyptians. In the early period referred to, it was not yet possible to use great house as perfectly synonymous with king. Expression like to follow the great house on his chariot in which the etymology began to be forgotten. Do not occur in the time of the old and middle empire. It is only in the vernacular, vernacular style of the new empire that the title can be used in the loose way quoted above. It, it becomes the usual word for the king, superseding the early expression like humph for his majesty and stone, literally to use king. So Pharaoh, the title Pharaoh, was not used in the time of Yusuf al Islam who lived in the middle kingdom. Musa al Islam lived in the new kingdom. And this is what the hieroglyphics tell us. This is what the hieroglyphics tell us. So Musa al Islam lived in the new kingdom. Yusuf al Islam was in the middle old kingdom when the title Pharaoh was not used for the king. And Quran uses exactly the same language. How did Muhammad sallam, know that? How did he know to use the title king for the king of Yusuf and title Pharaoh for the king of Musa? How did he know this? Unless he was an Egyptologist, which I doubt uh, he could not have known this. And the story of Haman in the Quran. Now, this is German research. A German scholar who is a scholar of hieroglyphics. He studied the hieroglyphics, he came up with this research and he found a word written in hieroglyphics, Haman. Many Christians and Jewish scholars are saying, who is Haman? This is a new personality in the Quran. But modern research found out, the Egyptologists found out this research within the hieroglyphics that Haman was a person who was referred to by the Pharaoh as a man who was the chief of the workers in the stone quarries. These are the words inscribed in German there. The chief of the workers in the stone quarries. And what does the Quran say? In the Surah Ghafir, chapter 40, verse number 36. And Pharaoh said, O Haman, build me a tower that I may arrive at the ways. Build me a tower. Build me a tower. Haman is the one who builds the towers. And the hieroglyphics are telling us this. There is no way of Muhammad sallallahu knowing this because it was not in the Bible. It was not in the New Testament. Any other scriptures, even Talmud, the Jewish scriptures don't have a man named Haman. There is a person mentioned named, uh, with the name of Haman in the Bible, but he is not the same person. He is someone else. He is not an Egyptian. So Pharaoh's body. Now, the last point I will mention. This is the mummy of Ramses II, who is thought to be the Pharaoh of Musa alayhi salam, who was drowned and his body was thrown out according to the Quran. What does the Quran say? In chapter Yunus, chapter number 10, verse number 91 to 92. Now you believe while you refuse to believe before and you were on one of the evildoers and corruptors. Allah is talking to the Pharaoh. When he was drowning, he became a Muslim. He believed. So this day we shall deliver you or your dead body out of the sea that you may be assigned to those who come after you. And verily, many among mankind are heedless of our signs. Subhanallah. The, fairy, uh, the body of Pharaoh Ramses II was found in 19th century in a pyramid 
and is in the Cairo Museum today for you to go and look at. And this is thought to be the Pharaoh of Musa alayhi salam. How did Rasulullah alayhi salam know this? This was a prophecy fulfilled by the Quran. There is much more to tell you about the Quran and its divine origin, which I will do in my 15 minutes rebuttal. Wa akhiru da'wana and alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you very much, and thank you very much also for sticking to the time. Um, Adnan Rashid had 31 minutes, um, and Carlton uh, McDonald would also get 31 minutes uh, to keep things, uh, you know, in parity and even, inshallah. Carlton, over to you when you're ready. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much, Chair, for your warm introduction. Thank you very much the um, Maruf and, and friends for inviting me to speak on is the Quran a divine revelation from God? Firstly I should say that although it starts out saying uh, on the posters uh, Adnan Rashid versus Carlton MacDonald fortunately it's not going to be a fight it's not an arm wrestle it's in fact a dialogue we are friends and I regard all of us as brothers and sisters. We live in a time where belief in God is rare and the whole world is heading towards atheism. The world is at the moment ganging up on Muslims but it won't be long before the laws they put in place are used for Christians as well. So these occasions of dialogue are very important. But let me get straight to the topic at hand. It is indeed a very important topic. And when I first started debating with Ayaz uh, at the start of this year, he asked some very tough questions about the Bible. I am going to ask tough questions about the Quran. Because as I was asked tough questions about the Bible, I had to go back and study what do I believe. I hope as I ask tough questions of the Quran that you will also think, what do I believe? So it's not me attacking you, I'm trying to understand the Quran because I don't speak Arabic. So I'm going to talk about... I <laughs> don't know how this is going to work, my eyes aren't very good. Right, I'm going to talk about what is taught today um, in terms of what is taught by Muslims and compare that with what the Quran says. Then I'm going to look at um, what the Quran says in terms of what, what the Quran says about the Bible, what the Quran says about Christians, and what the Quran says about Jesus. The, I'm also going to look at what the Quran says about whether Christians are saved or not. And because I believe the Quran says one thing, and on a whole Muslim to taught something else, I'm going to ask the question, which should we follow? And then finally, in this session, I, I'm going to ask about the language of the Quran. Okay, so the Quran says in Surah 29, 46, we be, believe in the revelation which has come down to us and in that which came down to you. Um, our God and your God is one, and to him we bow in Islam. So the Quran seems to say that the God of the Christians and the God of the Muslims is the same God. If that is true, then that's good news. The Quran repeatedly says that the Bible is verified. Believe in what Allah has revealed, they say, we believe in that which was revealed to us and they deny what is besides that while it is the truth verifying that which they have. So the Quran came and it verifies what the Christians have. Surah 2, 101. And when they came to them, an apostle from Allah, verifying that which they have, a party of those who were given the book threw the book of Allah behind their backs as if they knew nothing. So the Christians knew that they had the truth and they threw the book of Allah, the Quran, behind their backs. So the Quran is saying that 
The Bible contains the truth. Surah 2, 144. Indeed, we see the turning of your face to heaven. So we shall surely turn you to a Qibla, which you shall like. Turn then your face toward the sacred mosque, and wherever you are, turn your face towards it. And those who have been given the book most surely know that it is the truth from their Lord. And Allah is not at all heedless of what they do. Surah 2, 144. So again, the Quran is saying that the Bible is the truth from the Lord of the Christians. The Bible is the truth from the Lord of the Christians. Surah 2, 146. Those whom we have given the book, the Christians, recognize him as they recognize their sons. And a party of them most surely conceal the truth while they know it. So some Christians conceal the truth even though they know it. 147. The truth is from your Lord, therefore you should not be of the doubters. So repeatedly we're seeing that the Bible is truth. The Bible contains truth. The Christians know the truth. Surah 4, 136. Oh, you who believe. Believe in Allah and his apostle and the book which he has revealed to his apostle and the book which he revealed before. If Allah revealed a book before the Quran, which book is that? You see, what I hear from um, the various Islamic scholars is, oh, that book doesn't exist. The book that was given to Moses doesn't exist because Deuteronomy 34 couldn't have been written by Moses. It describes Moses' death. That um, the Injil, the writings of Jesus, uh, don't exist because we, the Gospels are written by the Apostles. But Surah 4, 136 says, A book was revealed before. Which book existed at the time of uh, Muhammad? Only the Bible. There is no record of uh, there ever existing the Torah that the Islamic scholars tell us existed without Deuteronomy 34. There is no record of the Gospel of Jesus. The only thing that Muhammad would have been aware of is the Old and the New Testaments. Surah 4, 136 goes on to say, Whoever disbelieves in Allah and his angels and his apostles and the last day, he indeed stays off into remote error. So, Surah 4, 136, how can the book which was revealed before the Quran be anything other than the Bible, both Old and New Testament in the form that we have them today? Surah 568 says, O oh, followers of the book, Christians, you follow no good till you keep up the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and the Injil, the Gospels, and that which is revealed to you from your Lord. What could that be except the Bible in its entirety, Old and New Testaments? And surely that which has been revealed to you from your Lord shall make many of them increase in inordinacy and unbelief. Grieve not therefore for the unbelieving people. The Quran is establishing, it's verifying the Bible that Christians have as the word of God, as the truth from Allah. So if a Muslim believes the Quran is a divine revelation from Allah, then a Muslim should read the Old and the New Testament and believe that they are two from Allah because that's what the Quran says. Surah 569. Surely those who believe and those who are Jews and the Sabians and the Christians, whoever believes in Allah and the last day and does good, they shall have no fear nor shall they grieve. When? In the judgment. So, do you see that? Jews and Christians will not grieve in the judgment. This is what the Quran says. So if the Quran is describing the Jews and the Christians as not having to worry about the judgment, why should a Jew or a Christian change their belief? Is the Quran a divine revelation from God? Surah 6, 155. 
And this is a book we have revealed, blessed, therefore follow it, and guard against evil, that mercy may be shown to you. Surah 6, 156. Lest you say that the book was only revealed to two parties before us, and we were truly unaware of what they read. So a Muslim should read the Quran and they should also read the Bible, Old and New Testaments. That way they cannot say we were unaware of what the Christians and the Jews had, that which came before. So if you believe the Quran to be a divine revelation from God, then you have to read the Bible, Old and New Testaments. And I'm in fact advocating people to read the Bible. So let me ask a little question. How many people have read the Quran? Put your hand up. Excellent. Very good. Now, how many people uh, have read the Quran outside of the mosque? So at home. Excellent. How many people have read the Quran in their native tongue? Urdu. All right. A, f a lot fewer hands now. But that's good. But the number of hands that went up for reading in uh, reading the Quran that meant in Arabic. But in your mother tongue is how you understand um, scriptures properly. I'm going to come onto the language in a moment. But I'm advocating that we read the Quran in a language that we understand and follow its advice, particularly when it says, read the Bible, Old and New Testaments. Now the Quran in um, Surah 5, verse 5 says, the day, sorry, this day all the good things are allowed to you and the food of those who've been given the book, i.e. the food that belongs to Christians. Now you don't need to worry, um, the church that I go to, we don't eat pork or lobster or any unclean meats. We only eat clean meat and we should only eat meat that has been killed either um, in the Muslim or the Jewish way, either halal meat or um, kosher meat. So you can eat my food. You can eat the food of those who have been given the book. It's lawful for you and your food is lawful for them. And the chase from among the believing women and the chase from among those who have been given the book before you are lawful for you when you've given them their dowries, taking them in marriage. So it's okay for a Muslim to marry a Christian if they believe in the Bible. So it, it, it's getting difficult for me as a Christian to see why should I change if the Quran is establishing my faith? Surah 3 verse 55 Behold, Allah said, O Jesus, I will take thee and raise thee to myself and clear thee of the falsehoods of those who blaspheme. I will make those who follow thee superior to those who reject faith. So it seems that the Quran is saying here that Christians are going to be superior to those who reject faith. So, you know, I feel quite good when I read the Quran and it tells me because I follow Jesus, I am superior. Jesus, the Prince of Peace. I'm sure some of you are saying, well, you know, Jesus didn't die. Well, actually, if you read the Quran, Surah 19, verse 33 says, And peace on me on the day I was born, and the day I die, and on the day I am raised to life. The next verse, 34, such is Isa, Jesus, son of Maryam. This is the saying of truth about which they dispute. So if you don't believe that Jesus died, this is the saying of truth about which people dispute. Which people? I'm sure some of you will dispute this. Are you disputing the Quran? If you dispute this verse of the Quran, then you don't believe it to be a revelation from God. The importance of the Bible. How do you find out information about creation? There's a little bit in the Quran. How do you find out a little information about Abraham? There's a little bit in the Quran. How do you find out about Ishmael? There's uh, a lot in the Quran. How do you find out about Moses? There is 
a whole lot about Moses in the Bible. How do you find out about Jesus? There's a little bit in the Quran. How do you find out about the second coming of Jesus? All of these things are important. And to find out about them, it's not enough just to read the Quran. You have to read the Bible. The Old Testament for creation, Abraham, Noah, David, Ishmael, Moses, and the New Testament for Jesus and his second coming. A good Muslim, if they believe in the Quran, must believe the Bible. I asked you a few moments ago if you've read the whole Quran and the uh, place was full of uplifted hands. I'm not going to ask you if you've read the Bible. But you should ask yourself. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15. I was expecting uh, Adnan to use this as a prophecy of Muhammad. The Lord thy God, Deuteronomy 18 15 in the Bible, says the Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, he's speaking to Moses, of thy brethren, like unto um, me, unto him ye shall hearken. So that's what God said to Moses. I'm sorry you can't see this very well. It says, of thy brethren. So we have Abraham. Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. Isaac had 12 sons. Ishmael had 12 sons. If you want to find out the names of the 12 sons of Ishmael, can you find it in the Quran? So that's another good reason to read the Bible because the 12 sons, sons of Ishmael are mentioned in Genesis 25, as Adnan mentioned earlier. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The, um, the Lord thy God will raise up a prophet from the midst of thee. He will be a Jew. Because Moses was of the tribe of Levi, and Levi was one of the twelve sons of Jacob, so he would be a Jew. He would be uh, of your brethren. Now, Jacob is a cousin. Ishmael, or um, yeah, Ishmael would be a a distant cousin. He would be like Moses, and the people, the children of Israel, would listen to him, or should listen to him. Verse, that was verse 15. Verse 18. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Who is this speaking about? Is it Muhammad? Or is it Jesus? Well, let's have a look at Moses. Since this prophet is going to be like Moses, let's look at a few things. In... Exodus chapter 1 verse 15 we realize that there was a prophecy of 400 years Israel will, will come out of Egypt and as a result Pharaoh decided he would kill all the babies of the Hebrew children to stop this prophecy coming true so Pharaoh tried to kill the children Moses escaped from Egypt Exodus 34 verse 28 Moses is in the Mount Sinai, Galatians 4.25, Adnan. It says that Sinai is in Arabia. Anyway, Moses is in the Mount Sinai for 40 days without food. Moses could read and write, and he was told to write a book. Moses died... Um, at 120 years of age, his death was, I've used the word miraculous, but it was unnatural in that he wasn't sick, he just died. And no one knew um, where he was buried. But according to Jude verse 9, where it says that uh, Michael contended with, um, contended with the devil over the body of Moses, and in Matthew 17 verse 3, when on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus talks with Moses and Elijah and his face lightens up before them as Moses' face was lightened up when he came down from the mountain. And the disciple says, shall we make three tabernacles? One for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. So Moses was resurrected and that's why he could meet Jesus on the mountain, Matthew chapter 17. So. 
The babies were killed to stop Moses, Moses' death. 40 days without food. He could read and write. He had an unnatural death and he was resurrected. Jesus, at the time of Jesus' birth, the babies were killed to, stri- to try to stop the deliverer coming out. Jesus escaped to Egypt. He was in um, Bethlehem, but escaped to Egypt. He was 40 days without food. Matthew chapter 4, Luke chapter 4. He could read. He stood up in the temple to read Luke 4. In John chapter 8, he stood on the ground and wrote when the woman was caught in adultery. He could read and write. He had an unnatural death at the hands of um, the Romans. And he was resurrected. What does the Quran say? I've, I've got eight minutes left. Believe in Allah and his messenger, the prophet who can neither read nor write. So he's not like Moses in that respect. And we could look at others. There were, as far as I know, there was no murdering of the babies at the time of um, Muhammad's birth. Um, as far as I know, he didn't fast for 40 days and 40 nights without food. Although uh, Ramadan is a month of fasting, it's not 40 days and 40 nights without food. You eat from sunset to sun, sunrise. Okay, I'm, I'm winding up. The Quran exists in Arabic. It only truly exists in Arabic. And if you read the Quran, as you know, you must read it in Arabic. I am a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. The group of Christians who object to um, the Pope's authority or protest about the Pope's claims to be able to interpret the Bible are called Protestants, those who protest about the Pope. Now the reformation of Christianity, the change, the revolution in Christianity occurred because people could have the Bible in their own language. A small percentage, it's a lot of people I know, a lot of um, Muslims speak Arabic, but in terms of the 1.4 billion Muslims in the world, a small percentage speak Arabic. I don't know if my son's still here, but he could speak uh, he's been learning Latin at school. I have no idea about Latin. And at the time of Muhammad, there was a Catholic principle. The Roman Catholic Church had this principle. The Bible must be read in Latin and interpreted by the priests. The ordinary person could not understand the Bible. That was the Roman Catholic teaching at the time of Muhammad. The principle of the Protestant Church, the Reformation Church, those who believe in the Bible and want to read it for themselves is John Wycliffe in 1380 translated the Bible from um, Latin into English. And his principle was the Bible must be read and understood by everybody, even the plowboy. The boy who's working in the field should be able to read the Bible and understand it. Now, if we in the Christian world want the Bible in our own language, and that's why the Christian world has really developed, why would we want to go to a system where, as we hear the Quran being read, we can't understand what's being said? And as a consequence, as it was in the the Roman Catholic days, people had to put their confidence in the priests, in the Pope. If I'm a Muslim, I have to put my confidence in my teachers. If the Quran is the word of God, why can't I put my confidence in something that I can read and understand for myself? It's interesting that the Quran makes reference to those same Catholic priests. Surah 582. Certainly, you will find the most violent of people in enmity... For those who believe, i.e. those enemies of Islam, the most violent are the Jews, Surah 582. And those who are polytheists, and you will certainly find the nearest in friendship to those who believe, the nearest in friendship to the Muslims, to be those who say, we are Christians. But actually, you are not interested in those who say they are Christians. There's a Bushman who lives in America, and he says he's a Christian. But you're not interested in those who say they are Christians. You're interested in those who live 
like Christians. But anyway, Surah 582 finishes off. The Christians are nearest to the Muslims because there are priests and monks among them and because they do not behave proudly. So actually you'll find there is so much similarity between that old Roman Catholic system and the new Islamic system. I need to finish off very quickly. Okay, why did Caliph Uthman, I've, it, it says Uthman because I copied it directly from um, a forum of Islam website. But why did Caliph Uthman burn all the original copies and fragments of the original Quran? I know all you Muslims know that the Quran originals have been burnt and lost. But why did Caliph Uthman burn them? The answer I got a few weeks ago when we had a dialogue was there were different dialects. A dialect is a spoken form of a language. So if a dialect is a spoken form, why burn a written form? Surely it would be good to have the originals so that you can compare the originals with what you have today. Can you imagine someone saying, I am thinking of burning the Quran? What would happen to them? Now, I'm not thinking of burning the Quran because, you know, it points to the Bible. But Caliph Uthman burned the Quran, and you guys think this is, this is okay. If it's okay for him, well, it's not okay for anyone. But the fact that he burnt it and has collected them and said, you know, this is the one that is the authentic one, our confidence, if it's in the Quran, is in Caliph Uthman. Because that process of verification word by word of all the different Qurans um, isn't transparent. Our confidence is in Uthman. And then finally, Okay, I'll, I'll skip over that. That's that handsome man that um, I'm debating with today. And he's talking about the 60,000 hadiths. Now, what are hadiths? Now, 60,000 hadiths. Hadiths, um, in um, Adnan's speech, help us to interpret the Quran. 60,000, well, if you divide 60,000 by 365, you end up with 164 years to uh, read all of the uh, hadiths to help us to interpret the Bibles. You know, the Catholic Church used to say, you can't read the Bible, you must read all the church fathers. 60,000. You can't read all of the hadiths. The Quran says, some of its verses are decisive, others are allegorical. Surah 3 verse 7. And then it finishes Surah 3 verse 7. Uh, None knows its interpretation except Allah. None can interpret the Quran except Allah. 60,000 hadiths, what for? The Quran says none can interpret it. Well, I think I'll just jump ahead to my summary. It's impossible for anyone to conclude that the Quran is without doubt from God unless three conditions they heard the Quran dictated by Gabriel to Muhammad one they must have heard it dictated and witnessed its um, transmission from heaven to earth secondly they must have read the original Quran as written by Muhammad's followers and thirdly they must be fluent in Arabic to say this is what I heard Gabriel say to Muhammad and that's the only way anyone on planet earth can verify that what we have now came from God. What we have to do is put our confidence in what came down. So my last slide. We can't prove without a shadow of a doubt that it is the word of God unless we have those three conditions. We have to take it on faith. But we can decide it's not the word of God if any one of these conditions holds. Number one, if we find in the Quran something that is not true. Secondly, if we find something that contradicts itself or the word of God. For the Christian, if we find something that contradicts the Bible, we'll say 
then it can't be the word of God. Thirdly, if we find any prophecy that failed to come true, it's not the word of God. And finally, if it fails the biblical test of truth, which I'll talk about in my next 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, thank you very much. We now come to the rebuttal stage. Each um, of the speakers will get uh, 15 minutes each to respond, uh, you know, respectively. And we begin with a non machine. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam wa ala khatum al-anbiya. Wa sayyidu al-mursaleen. Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi al-ghurri al-mayameen. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd. It is very clear for me today that Carlton has already accepted that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of God. Because Carlton did not actually respond to one of my arguments I put forward in my opening statement. I stated from the Bible, I quoted from the Bible, stating that there is someone coming from Tehran. Right, if Galatians says that Sinai is Arabia, can you deny that Paran is Arabia? If Paran in Arabic, Faran is Arabia, and if it's Makkah, it's in South, there's a well there, which is the well of Zamzam, and from that city, very city, is coming a prophet with the law in his right hand. Who is that person? Again in the book of Isaiah, chapter 29, verse 12, it is stated that when the book is given to the one who is not learned, it is said to him, read, and he says, I am not learned. Ma ana in. The Hebrew text in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the oldest existing text of the Bible, states the word Iqra. Hebrew, Aramaic, Arabic are sister languages. They are very similar. The word there is Iqra. When it, when it will be said to the person Iqra, in Arabic, Muhammad sallallahu replied, Ma ana in. Book of Isaiah chapter 29 verse 12. Who is this? And what book is this? Then, the book of Isaiah chapter 42. A man coming from the wilderness of Kedar. Villages that Kedar doeth inhabit. That's your Bible. He will put the idols worshipper to shame. He will bring justice on the land. He will bring a new law. He will be a messenger of God. All these points are there in the chapter 42 of book of Isaiah. Who is this? Who is coming from the descendants of Kedar? When we go to the book of Ibn Ishaq, the earliest biography of Rasulullah, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we find that he is number 60 from Kedar. Direct descendants of Kedar. What more do you need? What more do you need? Check the biographies. If Muhammad is the descendants of Kedar, he is the only prophet who came from Arabia. He is very well, clearly, in specific words, mentioned in your book. Then I gave you the evidences from the embryology in the Quran. Modern scientists, Dr. Keith Moore and Dr. Basar from Canada, many more scholars, which I can quote, they stated that this has to be a divine inspiration. There is no way of a man sitting in the middle of Arabian desert in 7th century CE to know all of this without a microscope. In 1940s when they came to know these embryonic stages. Not in 7th century Arabia. Aristotle was writing about embryology. Hippocrates, the Greek philosopher and the scientist was writing about embryology. Indians knew about embryology. So, so did Galen. Galen, a Roman scientist was writing about embryology. All of them were wrong. They believed that the child is formed from the menstrual blood. The mixture of menstrual blood and sperm. Quran declared all of those theories to be false. And Quran gave the correct theory, which today in 21st century is being affirmed by the scientists. Then I gave you evidence of the Egyptology. Could Prophet Muhammad read hieroglyphics? Impossible. Impossible. Because the knowledge of hieroglyphics came about in late 18th century when they found a rock in Egypt known as Rosetta Stone. 
Hieroglyphics were a dead language. On Rosetta Stone, there are three languages. Hieroglyphics, the middle language, and the Greek. All three of them stating the same contents. From the Greek, they were able to decode the hieroglyphics. When they translated the Greek into the hieroglyphics, that's how they realized, that's how they found out what the hieroglyphics are actually saying. And then came about in 1824 a scholar who broke the language of hieroglyphics and they could read the ancient Egyptian language whereby they found out Haman was a man who was commanded by Pharaoh to be the chief of the stone workers. And Quran tells us Haman, Pharaoh said to Haman, build me a tower. How did Muhammad know all of this? Then I come to the prophecies. Before I come on to prophecies, I'd like to address the point of Uthmanic manuscripts. The Quran of Uthman, St. Petersburg, Russia, exactly the same as I one carry in front of me, without any vowels, any dots, any diacritical marks, nothing. Are the contents different? No. Do we recite them differently? Yes. We have 10 different ways of recitation going back to Prophet himself, direct transmission to Prophet himself through multiple chains. Every single recitation himself originating in Prophet himself. This is a copy from the first century of Islam. Don't think it's something in the museum. I carry one in my hand right here, right now. This is a dated coin from the first century of Islam. A dirham from the time of Abdul Malik bin Marwan. The Khalifa of Banu Umayya, the entire Surah Ikhlas is there. And I can get a child from the congregation to come and read it for you. He will read it exactly the way we read it today. It's written there on this coin. And the coin is dated 86 Hijri when Anas bin Malik, the companion of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was alive. He died in 90s. Quran was distributed publicly, openly within the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and the Sahaba and companions. There was no question of Quran being lost. Then these are the parchments from the mid first century of Islam. About 50 Hijri. Can you imagine having a manuscript of the Bible that big from year 50 CE? Christians would shoot us, people like me. They would say, how dare you come in front of us and tell us Bible is corrupted. We have a parchment, one page from 50 CE. Christians make our life difficult, the missionaries. I'm not saying Carlton is like that. Carlton is a gentleman. I've, I've debated some vicious Christians. And the earliest manuscript they have is this size. This size is from the second century CE. And it's the Gospel of John. That is the earliest manuscript they have. And they make our life difficult with that particular manuscript. We have thousands of parchments from the middle of first century of Islam. This is tip of the iceberg. In Sana, in Yemen, entire library of the Quran codices was found. And this belongs to that. Can you see now, look clearly, in the picture, there is text at the back. There is ink which you can read clearly. And there is misty ink right behind that text you can see in front of you. You can see that this parchment was rubbed out. There was something written underneath. And on top, this was written. On top, this was written. Now when Carlton makes a claim, Uthman burned the copies of Quran. That's a very attractive claim Christians make. But when we study the reality of that claim, it comes out to be something else. Uthman did not do anything on his own. Uthman was the earliest, one of the earliest Muslims. He married two daughters of Prophet. Do you accept the Quran we have comes from Uthman, Carlton? I'm not sure. Well, you made a claim that Uthman burned the copies. And the Quran we read today is the same Quran. Okay, let's say yes. Okay, that makes my job much easier. Alhamdulillah, my case is over. I rest my case here. If the Quran comes from one of the earliest Prophet, from companions of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we are happy with that. Because Prophet Muhammad said about them, Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnati al khulafa al rashidin al mahdiin min ba'di. Upon you is my way and the way of my rightly guided caliphs who will govern for 30 years. Uthman was one of them. This gives him the authority to do what he did. And what did he do? 
You can see the text at the back. He didn't only burn the copies. They used the parchments. They wiped them out with water. What was written before in wrong spellings. And then the correct spellings were adopted. What is the evidence of this claim? The spellings. If we go to the book. Uthman sent one of his companions to see Ubay bin Kaab, who was one of the writers of the Quran manuscript when Uthman was carrying out the recension of Quran. And he sent one of his companions to correct three words in three different surahs. Listen to me carefully. Three words. Words. He sent one of his companions to speak to Ubay bin Kaab to correct three words in three different surahs to spell them correctly because previously they were spelled wrongly that's where the confusion was coming from in reciting them Arabs were not literate people Arabs were illiterate they didn't know how to read and write in the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam only 10 people knew how to read and write in the Quraysh Islam brought the revolution of reading and writing this was the first time in the history of mankind when children, young as four or five, were learning how to read and write. Never before this happened. Never. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the Quran, وَمَا أَرْسَلَّكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ O Muhammad, we send you not, we sent you not except as a mercy to mankind. This is one of the ways Islam's mercy was manifested in the people. They educated themselves. Now when they, were start, when they started to read and write, their writing wasn't perfect. So people were writing things with, for their own convenience. They wrote these parchments. Now, there was a difference among the people in reciting. Sahabas came to Uthman that we need to standardize the text of Islam, put the Quran, put it in right spellings that people don't make mistakes. Uthman collected 12 people. He gathered a council of Sahaba. The companions of Prophet Muhammad, he said to them, we need to do something about this. We need to gather people on one text. And we are the authorities who learned the Quran directly from Prophet himself, we need to do it now, that the later generations can be content with the text. They got together, all of the Sahaba unanimously agreed, he did this, and with the permission of the Sahaba, he got rid of the faulty copies. We do it today. We do it today. We burn Qurans today. Those which, which we don't need. If you go to a masjid, they find fragments. What do they do with fragments? They put them aside to burn them. So, these are the things which you have to understand. Now, you made many claims in your presentation that Jesus said, the day I die, peace be unto the day I die, peace be unto the day I was born and when I'm raised alive. Are you referring to resurrection by this? Surely yes. Because, yes, no. In the Quran doesn't mean that he was resurrected alive. This is talking about his ascension to the Father, which is mentioned in the Bible, in the book of John, chapter 20, verse number 17, when he said to Mary Magdalene, that go and tell my brethren, I go on to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Jesus had a God, he is not a God. He had a God. So he was going to his God. This is the ascension which Quran is referring to. Not his death and resurrection. Because Quran in chapter 4, verse number 158, clearly states, They killed him not. They crucified him not. And then in the end it states, They did not kill him for certain. Quran is very clear on that cartoon. You need to do some homework please. So... Believe in the book, and you're saying which books are they? Only the book of Moses and Jesus were around at the time, and Quran is asking you to believe. Did you know there's a book mentioned in the Quran, the book of Ibrahim? Sohufi Ibrahim of Musa. I mentioned in my presentation, I gave the reference as well. So, where is the book of Ibrahim for us to believe in? If that is the argument you're using. So, your argument is flawed because of that, because Quran is referring to those books which existed in one time. It was revealed on Musa, it was revealed on Isa, where is it today? We don't know. Because Quran in chapter 2, verse number 78, clearly states, فَوَيْلُنْ لِلَّذِينَ يَكْتُبُونَ الْكِتَابِ بِأَيْدِهِمْ ثُمَّ يَقُولُونَ هَارَ مِنْ عِنْدِ اللَّهِ لَيَشْتَرُ بِهِ ثَمَّنًا قَلِيلًا فَوَيْلُنْ لَهُمْ مِمَّا كَتَبَتْ أَيْدِهِمْ وَوَيْلُنْ لَهُمْ مِمَّا يَكْسِبُونَ Woe be unto those who write the books with their own hands and say this is from Allah. Little do they earn. That's what Quran says about the Bible. Book of Jeremiah chapter 8 verse number 8 telling you, your own Bible is telling you the Bible is corrupted. Please when you come back, 
in your presentation can you read book of jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8 to this congregation and tell them what it means your own bible isn't you're telling us to read your bible you ask the muslims to read the bible by the way i'll ask muslims how many of you read the quran in english you asked them about urdu that's why you didn't see any hands we're in england cartel <laughs> this is england this is not pakistan so they all read the Quran in English and they know what's in the Quran. You saw the hands there. So my point is clear. Carlton is still to answer to my questions I raised about the Bible, embryology, scientific miracle, historical miracle, Egyptology, uh, Egyptology in the Quran. And uh, we have parchments from the middle of the first century of Islam. Our Quran is exactly the same as that. And that Quran is coming from the companions of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And we trust them. We trust their judgment because Prophet told us to trust them. So everything which is coming from the companion, Alhamdulillah. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, very quickly, I'll answer the questions that you've raised. I'll go back to Galatians chapter 4, verse 25. In fact, I'll, no, I'll come to that last um, about Padan. First of all, Isaiah 29, 12 to 15, about someone who cannot read. Isaiah 29, 12 to 15. Do I need the, the microphone? Stop the clock. All right, extra 17 seconds. Isaiah 29, 12 to 15. And the book is delivered to him that is not learned, saying, Read this, I pray thee. And he said, I'm not learned. Wherefore the people said, for as much, sorry, wherefore the Lord said, for as much as these people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among these people, even a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of the wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. If Muhammad is the person spoken of here, then that's really quite a condemnation on the people around them because the Bible is saying that he will turn their wise men and the understanding of the wise men to nothing. So I don't see how that is really good for Muhammad and, and his followers. The um, business about the development of a thesis. I'm surprised that um, you can't work out how to understand the development of a thesis. If you find an animal that has died and you decide, hmm, chicken or a lamb, I'm going to, sorry, not a lamb, a sheep, I'm going to kill it, and that animal is pregnant, then you can see the, the various developments of the unborn um, embryo of a lamb, a chicken, uh, of any animal. And that's how you can discover how the um, gestation of the unborn takes place. You don't need to read a book. You don't need to have a re revelation from God. You just need someone who maybe kills animals after they're pregnant in order to study the development of the unborn. And the Greeks were doing that um, for many, many centuries. Surah 23, 13 to 15. Surah 23, 13 to 15 says, then we placed him as a drop of sperm in a place of rest firmly fixed. Then we made the sperm into a clot of congealed blood. But the sperm isn't made into congealed blood. Then of that clot, we made a fetus lump. Then we made out of that lump bones and clothed the bones with flesh. Then we developed out of it another creature, so blessed be Allah, the best to create. We didn't see on the screen a little skeleton in the womb. We saw a little flesh. So if the skeleton comes first and then the flesh comes on top of it, that actually isn't accurate. We saw um, the, the uh, outline of an embryo where the skeleton isn't 
properly formed, you have flesh and the skeleton and they both have to grow together. We know from biology that life starts out as a single cell and the cell divides and divides and divides and divides. It's not bone first and then after the, the skeleton is complete, the skin, not at all. The whole um, creature begins from a nucleus and cell division. The, the uh, Surah 1668, the bee is like glass, Adnan said. Well, every child who steps on a fly or um, a beetle sees the fly and even the ants crunch. He knows that they are like glass. You don't need, again, a revelation from God to know that the bees and the ants are like glass. How did Muhammad know that um, the books were in fact scrolls? The Jews have always used scrolls. They still used, used scrolls. The printing came in the, the 1500s. So for Muhammad to know about scrolls is nothing miraculous. How did he know about King Joseph and, and Pharaoh? Ramesses and, and so on. Well, it's quite simple. Just read the Bible. The Bible tells you about Pharaoh and the Bible tells you about the Prime Minister, Joseph, who was given charge over the land. Um, Haman, well, it's difficult to argue against Haman, whether he was a, a historical figure or not. The evidence that uh, Adnan put on the screen of the German historian is, well, uh, it could be coincidence. And in fact, let me, let me take you on to the biblical... The biblical test of a prophet. Deuteronomy 18. There will be a prophet among your brethren. Verse 15, verse 18. Verse 21 says, And if you say in your heart, How shall we know the word that the Lord hath not spoken? How can we find out what God has not said? Here is the test. When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if a thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So if a prophet makes a prediction and the prediction doesn't come true, then that prophet has simply made it up. On an Islamic website, it says that there are six tests of prophecies. Number one, the prophecy must be clear. And it must contain sufficient detail to make its fulfillment by a wide variety of possible events unlikely. None of the events that Adnan described are so clear that you could say, yes, that is, well, maybe the Muslims can, but as a Christian I can't see, yes, that is the fulfillment of, of that prophecy. There's a prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and it talks about an image made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, and feet of iron and clay. And the prophecy was 600 years before Christ. That is, 2,600 years ago, the prophecy was there would be Babylon ruling the world. After Babylon would come Greece. After Greece would come Medo-Persia. Sorry. After Babylon, Medo-Persia. After Medo-Persia, Greece. After Greece, Rome. And never would anyone rule the whole world. 2,600 years ago in the Bible. That is a specific prophecy. That is a specific prophecy. When you've got prophecies like that, you can talk to me. Let, let's go on to um, the, the other conditions. Testing prophecies. The event that can fulfill the prophecy must be unusual or unique. The fact that the Greeks were studying science or that, little, um, that people could be chopping up animals to see how the, the fetus develops means it's not unique. That is not a prophecy. It's, not, it's, it's good science, but it's not prophecy. The prophecy must be made before the event that is supposed to be its fulfillment. Again, what we've heard are scientific um, understandings that now come to light. Well, actually, <laughs> science doesn't know how the pyramids were made. So, just because we discovered something recently, doesn't mean that it's something new. The science of the people who lived before the flood is much better than the science that we have today. And there's a book, René Norbergen, 
the secrets of the last races uh, for you to find those things out. I've got seven minutes left. The event foretold must not be of the sort that could be the result of an educated guess. The event that fulfilled the prophecy cannot be staged or the relevant circumstances manipulated. And those are the tests of prophecies. There are no prophecies in the Quran that meet those six criteria. Um, now, I said that if you want to find out if something is uh, true, you need to just find one thing that is false. Who wrote the Quran? The Quran says that Allah wrote the Quran. Well, actually, no, the Quran says that the Holy Spirit wrote the Quran. Now, you don't believe in Allah and the Holy Spirit and, and Jesus, but um, Allah wrote the Quran, the Holy Spirit wrote the Quran. Well, actually, no, it was um, Gabriel, Surah 297. And um, actually, Surah 15, verse 8, it was angels. The Bible says, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Creation in the Quran, uh, Surah 54, 49 and 50, happened in the twinkling of an eye. Surah 41, verse 9, it took two days. Actually, no, Surah 7.54, six days. Surah 10.3, it also took six days. And one day is a thousand years, according to Surah 32, verse 5. Oh, sorry, um... One day is 50,000 years, Surah 70, verse 4. Let me not talk about Adam. And those are just two sets of um, differences in the Quran where you can't say categorically who gave the, who um, delivered the Quran or how long creation was. The Bible test of a prophet, and this is coming back to um, Padan, um, Kedar, Arabia. Isaiah 8 verse 20, to the law and to the testimony. The law and the testimony refers to the Ten Commandments, called the, um, the testimony of the, the character of God. If they speak not according to the Ten Commandments, according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So very quickly, with four minutes left, Ten Commandments. The first one says, thou shalt have no other gods before me. And I find it interesting that Muhammad seems to have as much reverence as God does. If you, well, we, we know about, um, if people insult Muhammad, the same penalty at the hands of um, certain Islamic states as those who insult Allah. So is Muhammad on par with Allah? Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Commandment number two, thou shalt not make any graven images um, or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or in the earth beneath. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Now, Hajj involves going to Mecca and going around the Kaaba. What is worship? Worship is when someone makes something and will go to the thing and devote themselves to some activity in the presence of that thing. So when you go to the Kaaba, um, Mecca and the uh, Kaaba is so holy that non-Muslims are not permitted there. And every Muslim, once in their lifetime, should make it to Mecca and do Hajj. Now it was built by Abraham with three minutes to go. It housed hundreds of deities including Jesus and Mary and there's a list on the screen um, including Ishtar which we get the English Easter, a pagan festival. Constantine took pagan religion and gave it Christian names. Islam has taken a pagan shrine and made it the most holy place for the Muslim. How can I take the church of Satan and say, okay, I'm going to get rid of all things inside it and I'm going to make that the most holy place for me as a Christian? It doesn't make sense to me, I'm afraid. When they're there, they're stoning the devil. Um, the fourth commandment says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Quran says, um, Surah 447, we, Allah, curse the violators of Sabbath. The Quran establishes the Sabbath. How many Muslims keep the Sabbath day holy? Honor thy father and thy mother. Muslims have no problem with that. Thou shalt not kill. Atala Khamenei, when he killed um, thousands of Shias, says, no people have been killed in Persia, only beasts. 
he seems to think that you can do whatever you want. Thou shalt not commit adultery. I um, was quite disturbed by this surah. Do not compel your slave girls to prostitution. Whoever compels them, surely after their compulsion, Allah is forgiving, merciful. So don't do it, but if you do it, I'll forgive you. No problem with thou shalt not steal. Um, thou shalt not bear false witness. 40 seconds left. <clears throat> um, Surah 9. It's called the immunity. Freedom from obligation is proclaimed from Allah and his messenger toward those of the idolaters with whom you make a treaty. So if you make a treaty with idolaters, then honor that treaty for four months. At the end of four months, Surah 9.5, when the sacred months have passed, slay the idolaters where you find them. So this is giving Muslims license to say, yes, we agree that we'll have peace. And then when four months are up, to completely ignore that. That is a false witness. And all I'm going to say to finish is, oh, if you leave Islam, you're in trouble. If they turn renegades, seize them and slay them wherever you find them. I haven't finished yet. One more. The word of God is given so that we might know what's coming in the future. And the most important thing for us in these last days is to know prophecy. The most important thing for us to know is prophecy. The Bible is full of prophecies. I hope that you will follow the Quran's advice and read the Bible and if you can't understand the prophecies, I'm very happy to come back and to explain Daniel chapter 2 about the history of the world and Revelation talking about the end of the world and the mark of the beast. Do you know for 160 years my church has been teaching America will become the worst nation in history and cause terrible things? You may be surprised by America, but we are not. If you want to know what's going to happen in the future, make sure you study the Bible and understand it. sense and this is the direct exchanges between the two uh, contestants um, I don't know who is beginning first does somebody volunteer to begin the questioning first or you, shall I choose myself no, you go first okay so that, that means that you will ask the questions first and Carl will answer them no Do I you want to begin with the questions yeah first? yeah he asked the question first okay that's fine uh, if you stand, if you use that mic over there, and you can use this mic over here. Bismillah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah wa ba'd. Uh, Carlton, uh, first of all, you just made a claim a few minutes ago. Slay the idolaters wherever you find them. And that's a false testimony. Because you just don't respect the treaty. That, these are the words you said. Yeah? Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. Would you like to read uh, from verse number one to four? Okay. A declaration of immunity from Allah and his messenger to those of the pagans with whom you have contracted mutual alliances. Go ye then for four months backwards and forwards as ye will throughout the land, but know ye that you cannot frustrate Allah by your falsehood, but that Allah will cover with shame those who reject him. And an announcement from Allah and his messenger to the people assembled on the day of the great pilgrimage. That Allah and his messenger dissolve treaty obligations, dissolve treaty obligations with the pagans. If then you repent, it were best for you. But if you turn away, know that you cannot frustrate Allah and proclaim a grievous penalty to those who reject faith. But the treaties are not dissolved with those pagans with whom you have into what, what, was that Quran? The treaties are not resolved. That's correct. Okay, okay. And who have not subsequently failed you in aught, nor aided anyone against you, so fulfill your engagements with them to the end of their term. Right. Term. Yeah, right. For Allah, love of the righteous. Can I read five? You've asked me to read four. Yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, one. sure, sure. But when the forbidden months are passed, then fight and slay the pagans 
wherever you find them. Yeah. Okay. Now my question regarding this whole issue is, do you know the history behind this? Uh, it doesn't really matter. I understand what slay and um, <laughs> white means. Okay. So, so, so you read the Bible without knowing history behind the Bible? No, I don't. You don't. So why do you do that to Quran? Well, <laughs> because... Are you saying this is confusing and I need to know this? No, it's not, it's not confusing. It's very, very clear. It's saying what happened was the pagans of Quraysh had a treaty with Muslims for 10 years. Now, the clauses of the treaties were no party will attack the other party. They will both have peace for 10 years. And there were two tribes who allied with each party. For example, Banu Khuda, they allied with Muslims and Banu Bakr were allies of Quraysh. Banu Bakr attacked Banu Khuza and killed their men and the treaty was broken. Now Allah revealed the commandment in the Quran that those who respect the treaty, respect your treaty from your side until the appointed term, 10 years, 20 years, whatever it takes. But those who break the treaty, there is open war against them. That's what the Quran is saying and that's what the story behind the Quran is. So I request from you to read uh, the Quran uh, within its context which is the Sunnah, and which is the biography of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, authentically narrated, then you will understand what those verses are. So, now you know the story. Do you believe that's still a false testimony? Well, you say it's a false testimony. What I'm saying is that this is advice to a Muslim. And although you may not take it as such, there are people who say, we do not need to honor our... Um, treaties with adults. No, but the worst, the worst is saying that honor your treaty. In the verse number three, if you read, until it says, the term. Until the term, yes, 10 years, 20 years, when, whenever the Because they are also a party who agreed to the term and the time, right? So you have an agreement with the other party about the time, about the uh, end of, ending of the treaty. So when the treaty ends, if they don't renew it, then you can do what you like. But until the, until the appointed term, respect the treaty. So is this, so a, false, saying, is this a false testimony? You're, you're saying that the treaties are only made with a time limit. So in other words... No, whatever they made like that. No, 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 no. What, what I'm saying is, if I say, let's have peace between us, I'm not going to say for two weeks or two months or two years. I'm saying, let's have peace between us. But if, for example, this is what exactly what happened in the time of Quraysh, at uh, the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi between Quraysh and Prophet, that they appointed um, a time which was 10 years. This happened. No scholar on the face of the earth, no orientalist, no Christian scholar who studied Islam, pro like people like Professor Watt and Bell, they never, never ever claimed that this never happened. So this did happen. Uh, if it happened, there was a treaty in place which they broke. And uh, Allah revealed in the Quran, now they have broken the treaty, you can go against them. Is this a false testimony? Do you still stand by your statement? Yes, I do. This is advice. It says, it's called um, the immunity. Mm -hmm. Are you saying that it only applied to um, the, the, the treaty at that time? Because there are people who see this uh, today and say, we are free from our obligations. Um, bring them to me, I'll give them medicine. If, if you see those people. But my point is clear. Um, you, you, you can choose to have your own opinion. It's not a problem. Do I still continue with my questions? Do I ask yes. three questions? Here? Okay. So, now, you said that you raised an issue about the embryology in the Quran, which I believe that is one of the evidences of Quran's divine origin. Do you reject the testimony of the most renowned authority in the field of embryology. You, you, you're a professor in IT, where I respect your credentials in the field of IT. If I had something wrong with my laptop, I'll come to you. <laughs> but if we were to learn about embryology, we'd go to the authorities. Dr. Keith Moore is not a Muslim. He's an authority in this field. He clearly stated, now you said in your presentation that bone and flesh are formed together. Okay? Yep. That's what you said. You stand by that? <laughs> yes, for now. Okay, you do that. <laughs> Dr. Keith Moore, uh, in the third edition of his book, named 
Developing Human, on page number 364, he states, The shape of the skeleton determines the general appearance of the embryo in the bones stage during the seventh week. Muscles do not develop at that same time, but their development follows soon after. The muscles take their positions around the bones throughout the body and therefore clothe the bones. They clothe the bones. Thus the muscles take their well-known forms and structures. Let's read the Quran. What does the I'm here. So it's okay. then you make a sperm into a clot of congealed blood. So it sounds like it starts with a clot of blood. Then have that clot did the, the, Ar the Arabic word for, for that is nutfa. Nutfa doesn't actually mean this is a Arabic language can never be accurately translated into English. Okay. Uh, we, we can have expressions. Then on that clot we made a, a, a fetus lump. Mm -hmm. Then we made it out of that lump bones and clothed the Ibam. bones with flesh. Clothed the bones with muscles with flesh. flesh. No, the Arabic word is um, mudra. The Arabic word, let me confirm this. The Arabic word for this particular. Well, the English word is muscle, per se. No, Engl that's the, that is the English translation. But Arabic word is different there, which states otherwise. And I have. Um, can I take your Quran for a second, please? Okay. It says in Arabic, "Thumma khalaqna nutfa." That is the drop that we create from nutfa alaka. "Fakhalaqna alaka mudra." From alaka, a leech-like substance, clinging alak literally means to cling. Alaka mudra, mudra, something chewed. This is very, very precise in Arabic language. That's why the scholars, when they read these expressions in the Quran, and when they understood in uh, the Arabic context, context of the time, they were shocked. And I'll, come to, I'll, I'll read that in a second. فَخَلَقْنَ الْمُضْغَ إِبْوَامَ And this is the stage of the bones. And فَخَلَقْنَ الْإِبْوَامَ لَحْمَ لَحْمَ literally means to muscle. Lahm can mean muscle or flesh. Now, Quran is certainly stating that bones come before the flesh or muscle, right? This is exactly what Dr. Keith Moore is writing before he knows what the Quran says. Afterwards, the Muslim scholars approached him about this particular passage, and this is exactly he agreed with this. He agreed with it, and he said, and I quote in the book, the development developing human. Clinically oriented embryology, third edition, he states, At first I was astonished by the accuracy of the statements that were recorded in the 7th century AD, before the science of embryology was established. The interpretation of the verses in the Quran and Sunnah, translated by Sheikh Azindani, who explained what the words actually mean to him, and he says, are to the best of my knowledge accurate. Dr. Keith Moore is saying, the renowned authority on the field of embryology. So yes, his knowledge. Yes. Yeah. And there's another scholar, Dr. Prasad, who have quoted, who agreed with Dr. Kismore that there is no way of Muhammad knowing this in the 7th century Arabia, these stages and these descriptions of embryology. And you, you said that someone can see by see this by desecrating an animal, splitting the tummy and stomach of an animal. How do you see when you desecrate an animal the form of Mudra or Nutfa or Alaka? You can only find that. It's so small. Only the microscope can see it. This is why Dr. Keith Moore was confronted with this question. He was asked this question. So what if the Arabs knew this already? It's Dr. not microscopic at seven weeks. Sorry? It's not microscopic. I'm talking about Nutfa. Nutfa. Nutfa is the, the, drop, the drop stage. The drop stage. The very, very early stage when you cannot see it. So I leave, uh, I'll, I'll leave it with you to decide whether the Quran has any divine. Uh, Okay. Now will, uh, Ask three questions. Okay, my first question is really <clears throat> what confidence can we place in the hadiths? Those people who say they can interpret the Quran on uh, our behalf. What confidence can we place in the 60,000 hadiths? The confidence uh, we can place in hadiths is very, very clear in the Quran. Quran states. Uh, 
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم یا ایوہ الذین آمنوا اتیو اللہ و اتیو رسول و اولی الامری منکم او یو بلیف فالو اللہ ان فالو ایز میسنجر سو ہاو دو وی فالو دا میسنجر وی فالو دا میسنجر بائی فالوینگ دا حدیث سو دس ایز ویری ویری کلیر پریسائسلی کوٹیڈ ان دا قرآن دات وی ہاو تو ہاو کانفیڈنس حدیث ویچ ایز اثنٹکلی نیویٹیڈ وین ای سیڈ سکسٹی تھاؤزن حدیث دے آر اثنٹکلی نیویٹیڈ نو اور سکسٹی تھاؤزن ہاڈ ڈیفن کانٹینس Some of them, perhaps 5,000 are talking about the same thing. Maybe 2,000 are talking about the same thing. The Christians and the Jews don't have that. You have every single thing mingled in one book. You have the word of the prophets in Bible. You have the word of the historians. You have the word of the poets. You have the word of God in the Bible. That's where the problem is. And you consider every single word in the Bible as the word of God. But we separated it from the beginning. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he commanded his companions specifically not to write anything other than Quran lest you mix it with hadith or my sayings there is nothing more important than the Quran itself that's why it was so easy for them to collect it put it in one codex two years later and they have a book codified in one volume which we have today we have no doubt whatsoever that this Quran we have today is exactly the same Quran as the companions of Muhammad and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa himself were reading and this was a promise made in the Quran chapter 15 verse number 9 inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidun that we reveal this book and we will guard it this is a promise which was made by God Almighty which was fulfilled letter by letter if it was not bring you evidence okay you said that there was one Quran and ten different recitations. Mm. Now, if there are ten different recitations from one Quran, and the Quran was revealed over twelve years, what you're saying is that Muhammad, who couldn't read and write, heard revelations over twelve years, told them to his companions, and the companions managed to remember word for word, letter for letter, what Muhammad said over those twelve years. And Uthman, when he's um, collecting them all together, uh, could also re remember uh, word for word, more than twelve years after the first revelation, what was said. Okay, the answer to your question is, here with me, I will quickly, because otherwise it is very difficult to understand. How did the Quran get to us? Now this is the miracle of Quran. This is the promise of Allah. We have seven famous recitations. There are other three which are not very famous, but seven standard ones. Okay? From Medina, the narration we have of Quran is coming from Nafil. Okay? Who did Nafil quote from? Nafil, who died in 169 Hijri, he narrates from Yazid ibn Ka'ka. Ka, and he also narrates from Abdurrahman bin Hurmuz al-Araj and he also narrates from Muslim bin Jundub al-Hudayli and he also narrates from Jazid bin Roman and Shayba ibn Nisai so those but five, one oh. second, look, it, it is not finished there these five people are narrating from Abu Huraira companion of Prophet Muhammad Ibn Abbas, another companion of Prophet Muhammad Abdullah bin Ayash bin Abi Rabia another companion of Prophet Muhammad all four of these people, three people are narrating from the Prophet Prophet taught his companions the Quran, the recitation the companions taught those five persons I mentioned and Nafir is one authority who took from all of them this is one recitation from Medina directly transmitted from the Prophet through multiple chains then we go to the next one, Makkah recitation from Makkah which is called the recitation of Ibn Kathir Ibn Kathir died in 120 Hijri. He narrated from Abdullah bin Asai ibn Makhdumi. Masai uh, al-Makhdumi. He, this person, who was a Tabi, a student of companions of Prophet Muhammad, he narrated from the companion, Ubay bin Kaab. Ubay bin Kaab narrated from the Prophet. This is the first chain of Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir narrated from a second chain as well. He didn't just... Uh, rely upon one chain he, go, he went to another teacher to learn who was that? Mujahid bin Jabr Mujahid was the student of Ibn Abbas the cousin of Prophet Muhammad so if, I just clarify here so what he's saying is although the Quran was in existence instead of reading the Quran 
um, the people who were reciting went to the followers. Yes, there was a chain of narration. Quran would be narrated entirely from beginning to the end by one companion to his students 10, 15, 20, 30, 100, thousands. Uh, did you know how many companions Prophet Muhammad had? A lot. Over 100,000. 10,000 of them we still have preserved in books. There is a book you can approach. It's known as Usud al Ghaba fi Ma'rifat al Sahaba, written by Ibn Lathir. It has 10,000 biographies of companions of Prophet Muhammad. You know, if, if the Christ works why do you need anyone to interpret it? Especially the Quran says none but Allah can interpret it. Quran doesn't say that. If you read the verse carefully, this is your Quran. Can you read the verse? If you read the verse, uh, you will find out Quran doesn't say that. This is your interpretation of the Quran. He's supposed to be questioning you, I think. Yeah. 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 If you read the verse, please. Surah seven. Yes. Surah Ali Imran, verse number 7. Yes. He it is who has sent down to thee the book. In it are verses basic or fundamental of established meaning. They are the foundation of the book. Others are not of well established meaning, but those in whose hearts is perversity hmm. follow the part thereof that is not of well established meaning, seeking discord and searching for its hidden meanings, but no one knows its true meanings except Allah and those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say, we believe in the book, the whole of this is from our Lord, and none will grasp the message except men of understanding. Well, oh, that's different to the one. There you go. <laughs> in my defense, I should say that the Quran that I got was off the internet. So this is, <laughs> well, you, you laugh, but um, if we're told there's only one version, uh, I actually have two different printed versions, and um, so now there is a, uh, a, a modern version that gets rid of the difficulty of none can understand it except um, Allah. Because the, the version that's online is the ancient version where there's no copyright. The modern version is where there is still copyright. Uh, you can change it and make it we, palatable. We only, only have, fortunately, we only have one version, which is Arabic. That's the Quran. So uh, we have no problem. When I read the Quran, I look at, look at the Arabic text, not the English. That's why I do not get uh, misguided. So what you need to do, if you really want to debate Muslims, you have to... Um, I'm, not saying it's, it's a, I'm not saying it's a condition, but it is an advantage. You can, you can learn Arabic. Okay, my last question mm -hmm. is, uh, you said that I misquoted Surah, five, Surah 19, 33. Yes. Peace on me, mm. on the day I was born, and on the day I die, and on the day I'm raised to life. You uh, uh, No, these. not raised to life. Raised alive. Abu Awthu al hayya Well, again... That's I, Arabic. I, I again, your internet translation. I, I, uh, it's not raised to life, it's so, raised alive. So, peace is on me, the day I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I shall be raised up to life again. To life? Correct. To life again. That's wrong. Um, um, I won't throw it away though, because people might get upset. That I shall be raised up to life again. Now, when you read the Arabic, وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَىٰ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَيَّ يَوْمَ وُلِدْتُ Salam, but peace be unto, unto the day I was born. وَيَوْمَ amutu, When I die, when I'm raised alive, not raised to life. So this is the correct translation. If you read the Noble Quran translation, and I'll ask you to read this to congregation as well, for, for them to understand. This Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation is a very good translation, but it has many mistakes, like King James Version and NIV and all the other translations. No, the NIV has many mistakes, but not the... Uh, Abdullah Yusuf Ali is one of those examples. If you read chapter 3... And, uh, it is as you say, mm -hmm. and peace be upon me the day I was born, and the day I die. Mm -hmm. Did he die or didn't he die? No, he didn't die. He will die. He will die. Because and Quran is very clear. I 
die, and the day I shall be raised alive. So you're talking about the, the last bit, which is controversial, but the day I die, uh, this is Jesus. Yeah. Now, what does to die mean? Doesn't it mean to cease to live? It's, it is amazing. If you go to chapter 4, well, verse number 159, it answers your question. The day will die. 4159 says... Yeah. So you didn't like um, Surah 5.33, and so you take us to 4.159 says, mm -hmm. if you read it, there is none of the people of the scripture, mm -hmm. in brackets, Jews and Christians, yes. but must believe in him, mm -hmm. before his death, uh, I serve the son of Mariam, as only a messenger of Allah, and a human being before his death, uh, death, yes. Before his death. Qabla in Arabic, literally means that no one of the people of the book, Christian and Jews, will be left until they believe in him before his death. This is talking about the return of Jesus, the son of Mary, near the end of times. That's what the Quran is telling us, that he will return and then he will die. Qabla Moti, before his death. So he hasn't died. This is very clear in the Quran. So please do not bring this up in a, again in a, in a debate with the Muslim because uh, it, it, uh, this is not true. And um, it makes you look uh, that, that you haven't studied the Quran properly. So this is very, very clear in the Quran. So what you're saying is Jesus will return again and then he will die? Yes. What you believe. That's what you believe, don't you? He will return, but he will not die. It will be an end to life. Oh, because, because you believe he's God. That's another problem altogether. We have already had a debate last week, uh, 10 days ago on that. So, thank you very much indeed uh, for your question, Carlton. And we'll hand it to our brother. Nate. Sorry. Oh, 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 oh,